hello and uh, welcome to the final um, webinar in this series. Uh, some really nice comments coming through, so um, I'm very pleased that people have enjoyed and appreciated these. Um, and I think we should definitely look at doing this again another time. Um, so today's uh, webinar is Rhetorical Readers in Academic Writing, a corpus-based contrastive analysis of reader engagement in English, French and Spanish, presented by Niall Curry. I'm Simon Wright from Cambridge University Press, and I'll be moderating today's session along with the colleagues, Eve Lloyd and Sarah Stokes. This, as I just said, this is the final webinar in our series of academic talks, but we'll be putting on the, um, the talks to, so you can watch them again on the page which is currently the registration page. So we'll uh, put an, another button up there which says um, watch again. So in about a week's time, you should, if you've missed any of the talks, you can go back to that link on the cambridge.org slash academic hyphen English page and then you can watch those again. <clears throat> During the webinar today, you'll be able to hear our speaker and to see his slides, but you won't be able to see Niall himself. And you don't need a microphone. And if you want to ask a question, please use the chat box and we'll put the questions to Niall at the end of the session. If you want uh, to download a certificate of attendance for today's webinar, then the link will be on screen at the end of the session. Um, I mentioned in the, in the previous webinar that there was, a, I think there was a slight issue for some people with with um, actually downloading the certificates of attendance, but we've fixed that now. Apologies for any issues there. If you have attended previous session, we'll be emailing out the certificate links to you anyway, so you'll be able to get it that way. So just a little bit uh, about Niall. Uh, Niall Curry is a, a senior ELT research manager at Cambridge University Press and conducts research on language and language um, to inform materials development. He focuses on how we can use research from fields like corpus linguistics to better inform the choice of language to be learnt, as well as educational research to guide the best way to learn language. Prior to working at Cambridge University Press, Niall worked as a language teacher and a lecturer in a applied linguistics at universities in France and Ireland. He is also completing his PhD at the University of Limerick, Ireland, on corpus-based contrastive linguistics of academic writing in English, French, and Spanish. So we've just had uh, a lovely Kiwi accent, so I'm gonna hand you over to uh, somebody with a nice Irish accent. Over to you now. Uh, thank you so much, Simon, for that introduction. And thank you to everybody uh, who's uh, logged in today for this presentation. And so yes, uh, this talk that I'm giving is, is based on what is my PhD project, but also work that I'm doing here at Cambridge University Press to look at how we can use um, research from linguistics and academic writing to help inform English for academic purposes. Um, can everybody hear me okay? No? I'm seeing someone say they can't. Um, okay, I'll try and talk a little bit louder perhaps. Can you hear? Is, is this a bit clearer? Okay. okay. I'll just keep it a little bit loud. Do you think it will do that? Oh, okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, can people hear me better now? Okay, so I will start again. So thank you very much, uh, Simon, for that introduction. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about research that I've been doing on academic writing for my PhD, but also work that we're doing in uh, Cambridge University Press for um, academic writing. Um, I will begin. Um, so, <clears throat> for uh, this for this project, what we're looking at is the areas surrounding reader responsible and writer responsible languages. And I'm not necessarily sure if this is something that um, that you are familiar with, but it's quite a simple. Uh, uh, idea, I guess, surrounding what languages are. And the idea of reader and writer responsible languages is that uh, languages are culturally bound. And so that some languages might tend to focus more on the reader and some languages tend to focus more on the writer. And so if a language is reader responsible, what that means is it's the reader's job to try and figure out the text. Whereas in writer responsible languages, it's the writer's job to try and figure out the text. <clears throat> 
And what this means is when we're writing in a language that is not necessarily um, sharing these kind of same cultural constraints as our, as our previous or as our own language, our first language, then we might have difficulty anticipating the kind of expectations um, of the people that we're writing for. And this isn't necessarily um, as simple as saying one language is X, one language is Y, but then also what we might think about is the different contexts where we write. So if it's academic writing and it, if it's a particular type of text, um, we might say that writing in this context tends to be reader and writer responsible. And so what this project is looking at is um, it's trying to figure out in academic writing how this looks um, in terms of looking at English, French, and Spanish, and what we can say about um, academic writing from this from this perspective. Is there any difference? And if there is a difference, what is the difference? And then how would that be useful for learners of each of these languages? In this case, we're thinking about EAP. Um, how would it be useful to learners of EAP to um, to to understand and use this information? So effectively, what this looks at then is um, the idea of explicitness in, in languages and how they interact with their readers. When we think about uh, texts written in English, traditionally what we see in the literature is that they reflect a more reader-oriented attitude. And so this would be where we see things like signposting and lots of discourse markers identifying what's happening next, what happened before, and um, letting the reader know. And it's partly to do with the reader wanting to um, the writer wanting to tell the reader what's happening, but also that the reader tends to expect that, um, that kind of guidance. When we look at texts like French and Spanish, they tend to reflect a more writer-oriented attitude. And what that means is that there may be less explicit in inclusion of the reader in texts, um, and because they may not necessarily need it. So this isn't a, this is one language is better than the other kind of thing. One, one language is more thoughtful than the other kind of thing. It's not that. What we're saying here is that there are slight differences in the expectations from readers and the expectations from writers. And I wanted to find a little bit more about what those differences are and whether or not they're changing, uh, where Spanish scientific writing is seen to be increasingly anglicized. So it's often following more patterns that, um, that we see in English than would traditionally be seen in Spanish. And so what we see then, if we look at these three languages on a, on a, on a continuum, is that English could be seen as more reader-oriented and writer-responsible. So the writer has responsibility for writing for, uh, for make writing for the reader in a clearer way, as they would expect. French is more writer-oriented and reader-responsible, and Spanish is balancing somewhere in between. Um, so uh, that's what we're looking at today. And so you might wonder why this matters. Um, so what this all comes down to is the, is the inclusion of writers and readers in texts. And the ideas behind this come from um, research on writer's stance and reader engagement. So writer's stance being how writers personify themselves in the texts, how they include themselves and how they make their presence clear. And reader engagement, how we include readers in texts when we're writing. And this is important because all writing is, is a dialogue in a sense that it's written to be read and it's written to be understood by someone. So it's important to think about who that reader will be, whether that reader is a member of a research community, an examiner, a teacher, a friend. Um, we, we're always thinking of who we're writing for. Um, um, here, I guess, when, when we're thinking about academic language and academic context, I see there's a question where I say scientific writing. I mean more um, academic, uh, academic publications in, that, in, a, in the wider sense. Um, so why does this matter? So when we think about stance and engagement, what we're talking about, when we group those as, um, as a theme, that's referred to as evaluation in the literature. And really, it's to do with the way that we're able to express some judgment over things. Um, and by expressing judgment, we make our presence clear. We make our presence known. Uh, when we think about evaluation, what we see is that it's quite discipline specific. So different disciplines, whether it's economics, linguistics, medicine, hard sciences, soft sciences, they tend to have quite different expectations of how we represent ourselves and represent readers in texts. Uh, it tends to vary across languages, so different languages will deal with this in quite a different way. 
And it's valuable then for learners of academic writing to understand what the conventions are within the communities in which they're trying to write. So what can we say about writing in economics if you're, if you're doing that? Or how can you use this information? It's important because what we see from the literature is that without a competent knowledge of this academic, these kind of academic linguistic items, non-native academic writers can have difficulty publishing, where most of the publishing that's happening in the world is happening among native English speakers. And so much research that's happening in the world, much more of the research that's happening in the world is happening within, um, it's, it's not happening within non, uh, native speakers of English, it's happening in the wider academic community. But unless we can figure out how it is that what the expectations of these journal articles or these papers for example are um, how you can disseminate that information in a way that's expected it can be difficult to um, to to balance out that that inequality and looking at research from Highland we can see that gaps in knowledge like these evaluative markers um, they can present uh, they can be that, that are present in disciplinary discourse communities that if they're misused by novice writers they can lead Right, readers to infer overconfidence or a lack of confidence or directness from writers' claims. And so what that means is that if we're not necessarily using the, um, the, the reader engagement markers or the stance markers in the right way, it can be confusing for the reader who, who will interpret it in the way that they, they would normally interpret it. So they're quite, um, although they're, they often tend to be small little words and simple words, how they're used functionally can be quite confusing and, um, and important. So what is the aim of this research? So what it was was to deliver a linguistic description of reader pronouns in English, French and Spanish and also looking at questions. Um, so today I'm going to give examples from English and French because we have a limited amount of time and the data from English and French is fuller. Um, but I also have data on Spanish that I'm finishing up and with that what I'm going to bring that in when I'm talking about English and French so we can have that as a bit of a reference point to see how Spanish relates to these, these languages. And looking at um, the, the role of these pronouns and questions, looking at their use in context, and also looking at the um, equivalences across the three languages. And then looking at how these can be useful for EAP materials. So looking at the data, oh, this thing didn't appear, um, sorry. So looking at the data, what we have is um, a corpus of uh, English and French, um, which are in, from the Kiev corpus. So it's 50 research articles in economics from English, 50 research articles in economics from French, and then spoken, uh, or so ra rather Spanish economics research articles, 50, um, 50 articles that I've collected myself and annotated in the same way um, as the Kiap corpus. And so here what we have is a corpus of about 1.5 million words of academic writing in English, French and Spanish that are comparable based on the genres, the times, the, the distribution of writers, things like that. Um, so, so the idea is that with that we can see if there's any differences in And what I did then was a corpus-based contrastive analysis. So with that, what I did was I took my data and I decided that I was going to look at questions and inclusive markers like reader pronouns um, to see whether or not they function similarly. And then I had identified functions of questions and reader pronouns. And then I wanted to check whether or not they, these functions um, differed in a number of different ways. And so what I did was I tested them based on different types of equivalences, looking at their form, their syntax, and a number of other criteria that I'll show you in a moment. And then from that I fed, I, I was able to try and identify what were the trends in the use of questions and reader pronouns. And I'm going to give you some examples of that because I think it's quite theoretical here, but it's pretty straightforward when you actually look at the data. Um, oh, so there's my slides aren't showing up the the um, little pictures. But here the idea was that I had um, some um, a Venn diagram of uh, the three languages overlapping, and the idea is that they're shared on function. And 
what I wanted to do then was search the corpus to try and identify function and within the function um, I did a, a corpus based contrastive analysis which is what CBCA stands for what is a corpus based contrastive analysis and what I did was I looked for frequency information um, to try and identify what words are very frequent and I also did some targeted searches to try and identify what words um, what words were that I thought might work for questions and pronouns um, were in fact working for them. So this required quite a lot of searches, I think over a um, over hundred different terms, uh, maybe nearly 10,000 lines of texts that I went through manually and then from that tried to identify what was happening in these texts. Uh, and so what I found, let's say looking uh, at questions in English and French, is I found that there were over 500 types of over 500 questions I found in English and just under 400 questions in French and then I kind of reversed in um, in pronouns where there was a lot more examples of um, pronouns in French and fewer examples in English and then I broke them down into their individual functions where I looked at the functions of questions so the questions in the academic writing were being used to get attention they were being used to frame the discourse of the writing so at the, at the beginning to tell us a little bit about the writing they were being used to organize the text to help us um, work through the text and tell us what's coming next they were used to create a niche so you might raise a question and, um, and then that could be the question that you're hoping to answer um, used to express a critique of some sort, used to make a claim, so they might raise a question and then straight away try to answer that question by setting up that claim, and, um, and then also sometimes they were just real questions that they couldn't answer in the text, so they were maybe asking for problems that could be solved a little later on. And then for pronouns, what we saw was that the pronouns were being used um, for, organize, for organizational purposes. So we might see, see something like, we then will look at something. And so that is um, telling us how the text is being organized. We see them often as a passive, where the readers are being included as passive recipients of information. Uh, so um, this shows us, this shows us something. There's a lot of uh, use of pronouns to show community. So for this text, because I was looking at economics, we often see things like um, we see things like um, we as economists. So we as economists were were talking more broadly. So including the reader in a sense. Um, we have active ones, so opposite to passive, this is where the reader was involved in doing something in the paper. So sometimes analyzing information. Uh, sharing was often used when there was some kind of doubt, so if we didn't nec weren't necessarily sure of something, we might include the reader to, um, to make the, the doubt shared and I guess uh, like lightening the load or lightening the, the problems by sharing the problems. And then the last one, didactic, so this is where we saw that the reader pronouns were being used often with conditional sentences uh, to try and teach the reader something in some way. So it could be something like, if you were to do this, you would get X, Y, and Z. So um, the reader then is being told what would happen to them, explaining something to the reader. So all of these functions then are, are rhetorical in that we don't necessarily, especially for the questions, we're not anticipating an answer from anyone because we can't get an answer. Uh, the idea really is that they're serving some purpose where the reader is using them in order to use the reader rather the writer is using them in order to use the reader in some way to, um, to demonstrate a perspective or a point of view. And so how I analyzed them was across multiple different criteria. So I took each one of the, I took the questions, I broke them down into individual functions, and then within each function, I looked at things like sentence length, the types of questions or pronouns and the word classes. I looked at where they were occurring in texts, the types of verbs they were being used with, um, whether it was passive or active voice, the tense, the positive or negative, um, whether the, yeah, they're being used in positive or negative sentences, and how complex the sentence was. And the reason for this then was to try and identify what kind of trends were happening. So what do we do in English when we're trying to create a niche or express criticism? And what do we do in French when we're trying to express criticism? 
skepticism. And if they are the same, well, that's great. That'll be easy transfer. But if they're not the same, then that would be an important thing to notice if we're trying to teach learners how to critique um, using questions in different languages. And so to illustrate that, I'm going to give you a little bit more detail on how this looks. Um, so with questions um, uh, in, in English and French, what I saw is that they were used for very different reasons. Uh, most notably, the, there was the use of questions for expressing critiques in French and English. We see a, much more of these in French. And in English, we see a lot more examples of real questions, so questions being used for claims. Um, so what we're going to look at in a little bit is we're going to look at a function um, of questions being used to express critiques. When we look at um, questions being, or rather pronouns being used, we can see that French uses pronouns to organize text a lot more. And overall, we saw that French uses a lot more pronouns. When we look at um, English, we see that they use, uh, they see readers more often as passive recipients of information. So there's a lot more use of the passive function of reader pronouns. And both of them are using pronouns and quite balancedly in order to build community, to create relationships between, um, between the readers and the writers. Um, and we see with the, with the, the last point, the didactic one, um, that English definitely tries to explain things to the reader more, which isn't so surprising. Um, that's something that I guess we, I mentioned earlier on in the presentation that um, is something that we could see. Uh, yes, the, 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 this area would come under uh, discourse analysis, but I'm not quite a doctor yet. I'm almost, um, but it's very nice of you to say. Um, so let's take a look at questions of critique. So if we're thinking about questions that give some kind of criticism, um, what we might see in French is that they are longer sentences. They're much longer sentences. So the questions are quite long. Um, we see that they use lots of embedded questions. And what this means is that the questions don't look like questions. There's no question mark. Um, and it might be things like we might think in English we would see something, uh, we wonder if this is a problem or not. So we wonder if this is a problem or not. It doesn't look like a question. But it is a question. It's an embedded question. And so French uses a lot more of em embedded questions when they're doing this um, as opposed to English. We see them happening in the introduction section, um, which happens in English too, so that's a point of comparison. They tend to use verbs, so I use a, I use a system of verbs that I can't go into, um, into the detail on the system of verbs, because there's lots of information on that. But it's a, a taxonomy that looks at breaking verbs into either knowledge verbs, statement verbs, or cognitive verbs. And knowledge verbs is to do with like a lot of uh, not, like knowledge-based processes, like basically analyzing data and creating information, that type of thing. So they use a lot of um, verbs that would fall under this category of knowledge verbs. They, they look at, they look at, is the sound OK? I see Lucy says the sound is gone. Yeah, OK. Um, they look at present tense, um, so a lot of present tense action going on when they're using the questions to critique. Uh, the sentences are largely positive, they're in the active voice, and they're complex sentences, which means that they have subordinate clauses, so that they're quite complex. And what we saw in English, which is quite interesting, is that the, the sentences were much shorter. And so uh, they use content questions, and what that means is uh, questions like the WH questions, what, how, where, where the answer is some kind of inf piece of information. And I think that's quite one of the, ni the, the nicer differences between the two, is uh, that the, the use of embedded versus content questions. The verbs that they used were um, largely cognitive verbs, so this is more to do with like processing and thinking um, and perceptions, things like that. Uh, there was quite a balance of active and passive, and in English there was a many more varied use of tenses. So the tenses were there was there were examples of, of tenses that had no time at all, or that were um, that were balanced, or that were using different kinds of of language um, in general. And then we had uh, more complex sentences. So the complex sentences were being were, were the same again as in French.
Uh, when we look at um, some examples, so I won't go through the examples here, you can read them on screen, and the actual language itself isn't necessarily important if you don't speak French, it's not that big a deal, because the content here is about economics, and it doesn't make a lot of sense to me either, because I'm not an economist. But what what, it, what we needed to do for this was to look at the, the actual language, and then also look at the... Um, look at the examples uh, of language before and after and this was all coming from um, a research article in in English and French so written texts so we had to look at where it was where it was occurring in the text what was before what was after and what was happening in this sentence itself uh, and that was what we how we were able to identify these kind of trends and differences uh, and quickly, I'll just go through some pronouns, which is uh, kind of a similar thing, um, looking at pronouns that build community. So English was shorter. There were more examples of you or one, which was quite significant. They didn't really work for any other function other than building community. Um, they were using knowledge verbs, active voice, a lot of modality, and um, quite more complex sentences again. And then um, looking at the the French example, so there was longer sentences, um, passive pronouns, cognitive verbs, active voice, present tense, so the tenses is quite different there again. So again, we can see lots of interesting differences. So what are the implications then for teaching? Um, so this is coming from a corpus perspective. We can look at things like English for Academic Purposes or Francais Langue Académique or Espanol Con Fines Académico, which is, I guess, the th the, in the three languages, it's the same thing. Um, we can look at how we can use this to directly impact upon um, on language teaching in the classroom using corpora. So there's some interesting studies from Lee and Swales and Brown, and if any of you are interested, I can send you the references and stuff like that for these studies, um, who look at how we can use corpus linguistics in the classroom to help students analyze their own language. And there's so many tools that are available now, um, like AntConc, um, which is um, used by, which is by Lawrence Anthony in, in Japan. Um, he's also created something called Antcore Gen, which is a tool that can help you create your, um, your corpora instantly, which is uh, very exciting. And if I had known about it before I started this project, I would have, would have enjoyed using, but I did mine all manually. Um, and Yes, I will. I will refer to some Spanish, um, some Spanish stuff at the end for a little bit more context on that too. Um, so what you can do is look at how you can use corpus linguistics in the classroom. And here at Cambridge University Press, what we're doing is looking at how we can use this type of research to help inform some of the EAP courses that we're working on here. Also working with the University of Cambridge to look at how we can work with um, people working there in the area of academic language and corpus linguistics to try and figure out um, how effective some of these um, discourse markers could be in terms of improving people's writing. So we're looking at trying to incorporate this in as many ways as possible into uh, the research. But I think it's something that's worth um, drawing learners' attention to uh, quite broadly in general, just to get them to think about how this differs in their language or how it might be the same. And both of those things are useful. Um, uh, yes, um, I'll put that in at the end, some information on the ANCOMP tool. And so just to conclude, uh, what we saw is that there's varied roles of questions and pronouns across so that they, although they share some functions, how these functions are distributed and what their roles are is quite different. Um, the reader pronouns and questions differ in frequencies and functions, sentence length, word class, and distribution within languages. So there are so many different ways that they can differ. And so it's important to think about them at the level of the sentence. So where, how we can, how we write these, what we should look at. Uh, the level of the text, so how this is being used um, with text around them and the level of discourse, how this fits into this particular genre that we're looking at. Perhaps it'll be quite different for essays, perhaps it'll be quite different for, um, for, for different types of texts that students write. So what would be interesting, and I would love to hear if any of you are interested um, in this, um, to, to hear what your thoughts are, or how this would relate to your own students' writing, and um, what kind of information, how you, how you think you could use something like this. And to, to help understand, I guess, your students' writing. For me, this largely, as, a, as I suppose a summary, came from when I was working at a university in Ireland. I worked in a writing centre, 
and I had lots of students coming in who were looking at um, who were looking at different areas of language and wanted to know how to improve their writing. They weren't necessarily getting very good feedback. And one thing I saw amid students from China, for example, was that they often began their essays with this kind of proverbial um, kind of sayings. And this was something that was not something that I expected. And it was something that for them was absolutely normal to do in their own um, their own uh, academic writing context back home. And making it clear to them that this is something that's not wrong, but it's just different. And that your audience here is expecting something a little different. And this way we can, um, we can I guess, draw people's attention to seeing writing as not something that you need to terms of language, but also culture, that writing is culturally bound and that understanding these different cultures would be effective. Um, so thank you very much for, for coming to my talk and um, see some questions coming in. So if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask away. Thanks a lot, Nav. That's really good. Lots of comments coming through. I'll just have a quick look down the list to see what we've got here. Uh, I think there was one here which said, don't you find that all Latin languages produce much longer sentences uh, <laughs> written here than a good English sentence? <laughs> So it's, a, it's an interesting question, uh, and this, I guess, is where I can bring in some of the research I'm doing on Spanish at the moment, in that, um, so French definitely uses much longer sentences, but surprisingly, in some contexts with Spanish, the sentences can be quite short, comparable to English, um, which it's hard to say, because here we're looking at one very specific genre, and there is research that says that the Spanish academic writing is becoming more anglicized as time goes on. So perhaps there's a relationship between uh, between those two things. Um, but but yes, uh, so I think that largely there is um, there is some kind of relationship between Latin-based languages being longer. But uh, looking at things like Germanic languages, like um, German, for example, that has uh, very long sentences too. Um, and is notably a, a writer, a reader responsible language. Thank you. Another question here um, from Peng asks, are all the sentences that we read on corpus websites correct? And she's gone on to sort of clarify, I mean, we can see that how many times a certain word is used by a native speaker or ESL student, but what if there are some mistakes? <clears throat> Uh, that's a good good question. So with the data that I was looking at here, what I did was I collected data um, that that is representative of academic research produced by expert speakers. So this will have and this will have been edited by editorial teams and then produced in journals. So this language is, um, is, is representative of that. But you're absolutely right. I think this is the, the important thing to think of cor with corpora now as corpora are becoming so much better known and more used is that we, we don't just take the data as fact and move on but that we're critical about what this data represents and what the speakers or producers of the language you're analysing represent. Um, so yeah, so I think it's a good point. In this context, what, what we're looking at is people that represent the, the community that I'm, that I'm studying. And so it would be representative of that. Thanks very much.